during our discussion of the cohesion in uh, molecular solids such as the inert gas solids solid argon, krypton, xenon, neon etcetera. I made a mention about helium and remarked that even though helium is also an inert gas, but the behavior of solid helium is different substantially different from that of the other rare gas solids. So, today we will take this up for detailed discussion. Now, this discussion is going to be in general on quantum fluids and quantum solids and we will see that helium is a very important prototype for the behavior of quantum fluids and quantum solids. Helium differs from the other gases especially in its behavior at low temperatures. Its phase diagram is shown in figure 41. One can readily see that helium does not solidify at any temperature down to absolute 0 under ambient pressure an additional pressure of about 2.5 mega Pascals which is 25 atmospheres is necessary to solidify it. This is because of the 0 point energy which causes the helium atom to have a large amplitude of vibration about its equilibrium position in the solid. The solid has a hexagonal close pack structure and it becomes liquid after a phase transition from the HCP into the BCC or body centered cubic structure. Much more spectacular is the transition from a normal liquid phase into that of a superfluid phase as one can see in the phase diagram. You have got liquid helium 2 and liquid helium 1 two phases in the liquid state and separated by what is known as a lambda line. The transition from a normal liquid phase into that of a superfluid phase takes place at the so called lambda point. We will talk about it a little later. Let us now look at the superfluid phase which is characterized by 0 viscosity. So, superfluid helium. Is characterized why is it called superfluid? Zero viscosity. In this respect, it is the superfluid is somewhat similar to that of a superconductor, the behavior of a superconductor, which is which may be regarded as a charged fluid. So, it has zero electrical resistance, as we have already seen. And in the ordinary fluid state in the mass transport, the analog of electrical resistance is the viscous resistance to flow of the liquid. So, this viscous resistance vanishes in the case of a superfluid just like the electrical resistance vanishes in the case of a superconductor. In addition, it has also zero entropy in a thermodynamic sense. Because of this zero viscosity, it can flow through any minute orifice and also climb up the walls of a container. So, if you have superfluid helium, then it can climb up the walls and trickle out climb down and then you can see droplets coming up. So, the liquid will spontaneously come out of the container 
So, it will climb up the walls of a container to trickle out of it against the force of gravity. This is shown in figure 42, where you have two containers and the helium 2 will creep along surfaces in order to find its own level. After a short level, there are two containers here and the levels in the two containers will equalize after some time. The next picture 43 shows liquid helium in the superfluid phase and as long as it is a superfluid, it creeps up the wall of the cup as a thin film. It comes down on the outside as you can see in the photograph forming a drop which will fall into the liquid below. Another drop will form and another and so on until the cup is will empty itself. It will look almost miraculous. We talked about the lambda transition from the normal liquid phase into the superfluid phase lambda. Now, this is called the lambda transition because of the shape of the specific heat anomaly which occurs at this temperature. So, you have the specific heat and you have something like the shape is somewhat like this that is T lambda and uh, So, that is the roughly the kind of shape. This is shown exactly in figure 44. So, the resemblance to the figure lambda is what gives you the name of lambda transition. Why should the lambda transition occur? An answer for this was given by London in terms of what is known as a Bose-Einstein condensation. What is a Bose-Einstein condensation? Now, helium 4 is a boson. Helium 4 is the abundant isotope of helium. So, this is a boson which for satisfies the Bose-Einstein distribution. So, the distribution function has the form well. Now, G i n of E i is the number of particles in the state with energy in the ith state with energy E i and G i is the statistical weight of the state. Mu is the so called chemical potential. So, that is the distribution function, and looking at this distribution function, one finds some very interesting characteristics. The total number of particles. in this case helium atoms is n which is sigma n i e i. Now, if you look at this distribution function, it has some peculiar features. As t tends to 0, we find that n i n 0 tends to n in the ground state 0 corresponds to the ground state of energy E 0. So, 
in the limit t tending to 0 k n i n 0 equals n which is the same as limit t tending to 0 1 by exponential e 0 minus mu by k b t minus 1. So, this is this limit so far n equal to 10 to the power 22 the order of Avogadro number at t equal to 1 k we can easily verify by substituting here that e 0 minus mu is 1.4 into 10 to the power minus 38 uh, which is an extremely small number that is mu is very close to epsilon naught the ground state energy. This situation is shown in figure 45 where mu is shown to be extremely close to epsilon naught and closer to it than the first excited level. The first excited level lies here and mu is somewhere here. So, this is epsilon naught, this is epsilon 1, this is mu. Hence, most of the particles tend to occupy the ground state for ten t tending to 0. This is of course, possible for a boson assembly and this situation is known as the Bose-Einstein condensation. The temperature at which this happens namely the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature let us say T naught one has to define evaluate this n equals v by lambda cube into sigma that is the same as this is written in terms of as the Riemann zeta function zeta is the Riemann zeta function. And uh, lambda you see is defined as h by 2. So, in terms of these, this zeta function has is known to have the value 2.612. So, this can be written as where lambda is also known to have this value. So, inverting back we can write T naught the Bose Einstein condensation temperature as So, that is the defining equation for the Bose Einstein condensation temperature 3 by 2. Here rho is n by v the density. So, for 1 mole n is Avogadro number and therefore, we can calculate T naught and it turns out T naught equals 1.115 times m 
vm no this is q test where m is the mass of the helium atom for example in the case of helium so m is 4 for helium and the molar volume v m is in centimeter cube 27.6. So, with that we can calculate T naught for helium 4 and this turns out to be 3.14 Kelvin. The actual observed value for the lambda transition is 2.17 K. So, the Bose-Einstein condensation temperature calculated value is 3.14 K assuming that the helium gas is a Bose an ideal Bose-Einstein gas which is far from true it is not a gas it is a liquid. So, it does not really qualify as an ideal Bose-Einstein gas it is an approximation considering this approximation this is an extremely good agreement. So, the Bose-Einstein condensation picture of the lambda transition from the normal state into the superfluid state has been is accepted therefore. So, for in the limit of T tending to 0 we can calculate the rest of the sum for n. Now, we have taken out the ground state condensation. So, n minus n naught can be written as an integral integral the states are from 0 to infinity the standard density of states and here you have d by exponential. So, that integral goes as n times t by t naught for 3 by 2. Now, using the same picture the specific heat can also be calculated and compared with experiments. The specific heat behavior is very exact accurately measured both above and below the lambda transition. So, C v has the value 3 half n k v into 1 minus 0 0.231 T by T naught so 3 by 2 T naught by T plus 0 0.045 into T naught by T square so on. This is for T greater than T naught, this is at high temperatures and at low temperatures this has the value it is T by T naught to the power 3 by 2 or T less than T naught. So, the calculated values of the specific heat, the variation of the specific heat across the Bose Einstein condensation temperature is shown in figure 46 and it has a cusp at the Bose Einstein condensation temperature, unlike the lambda transition, but still the correspondence is quite close. 
Next we go on to consider the other isotope helium 3. The phase diagram of helium 3 is shown in figure 47. Now, helium 3 is a rare isotope and you can see that there is a polycritical point at y at the point y shown in the figure uh, which is at about 20 atmospheres pressure and 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 3 kelvin 2.5 milli kelvin temperature. So, the polycritical point occurs here. So, if the pressure is less than approximately 34 atmospheres you can see that there is a solid phase helium 3 enters into a superfluid phase at temperatures below 0 0.0025 kelvin 2.5 milli kelvin. There are two superfluid phases A and B which both show very unusual properties at the polycritical point y both the superfluid and the normal liquid coexist. You can see this is the normal liquid and you have two superfluid phases all three coexist at y that is why it is called a polycritical point. Once you apply a magnetic field the polycritical point y disappears as you can see in figure 48 and the phase A stretches down to zero pressure unlike in figure 47 in the absence of a magnetic field and a new superfluid phase A 1 appears between A and the normal liquid. As the magnetic field is strength is increased the B phase stretch shrinks towards lower temperatures. while A and A 1 phases grow until the B phase is completely replaced by the A phase at very high magnetic fields. Now, helium 3 is a fermion unlike helium 4 which is a boson. So, the Bose-Einstein condensation picture cannot be used to explain the occurrence of superfluidity the occurrence of the A and B phases etcetera in helium 3. It is more like the formation of Cooper pairs as in a superconductor. Pairs of helium atoms join together through interactions as in a superconductor. Once you form a pair of these fermions, then it becomes a boson assembly. The pairing is between neutral helium 3 atoms under weak attractive forces with s equal to 1 and l equal to 1. Unlike in the case of an ordinary superconductor, an s wave superconductor, where s is 0 and l is 0. The spin states in the different phases, the A b and a 1 are shown in table 41. The a phase has the spin states spin up spin up or spin down spin down. Now, that is a picture proposed by Anderson Morel and Brinkman. So, it is known as ABM phase. The B phase has all possibilities, it is a true triplet state which we discuss in the case of a ferromagnet can be either this or 
can be so all three states and that was a picture proposed by Ballion and Wertheimer. So, it is called B w phase. The A 1 phase is either this or this. That is the overall simplified picture of the superfluid phase transition in li liquid helium 3, which takes place at milli Kelvin temperatures much lower than that of liquid helium 4. We now go on to look at bit closely at the normal and superfluid phases of helium 4 based on the two fluid model proposed by Tissa. He suggested that for T less than T lambda, the superfluid helium 2 consists of a normal component as well as and a superfluid component. So, that is the basis of the two fluid model proposed by Tisa. So, n equals n n plus n s, where n n is the particle number of particles in the normal phase and the n s is the number of particles in the superfluid phase. The superfluid has 0 viscosity and 0 entropy, while the normal fluid contributes to viscosity. Therefore, we can write the density as and also the speed rho u is rho n u n plus rho s u s. These are the basic equations of the two fluid model. Now, a person called Andronikeshvili conducted a very interesting experiment. The experimental arrangement used by him is shown in figure 49. It consists of a pile of aluminum discs spaced 0.2 millimeter apart, very close, and mounted on a common axle. And this assembly rotates, is set in rotation in a liquid helium bath. This is shown in the figure. This means that only the normal component can rotate between the discs and therefore, it contributes to the moment of inertia.
the actual dynamical moment of inertia which determines the period of rotation. So, the ratio of the experimental and the geometrical moments of inertia gives the ratio rho n by rho. The ratio of the normal component density to the total density of the fluid. Well, there is a yet another method of measuring viscosity using a capillary. method for measuring viscosity in contrast to the this arrangement which is a kind of oscillating viscometer where the period of oscillation determines by this moment of inertia the period becomes longer because of the damping due to the normal component and the viscosity. Now, if you use Poiseuille's equation in order to determine the viscosity using a capillary, only the superfluid can pass through the capillary. Whereas, in the dampening of the disc here, it is only the normal component. So, the two experiments are different. So, give rise to totally different results which can be understood in terms of the two fluid model. A very remarkable consequence of this is typified by thermomechanical and mechano caloric effects which are the ref reverse of each other. Daunt and Mendelssohn immersed a heater immersed a heater in a helium 2 bath A, which is surrounded by another bath B. So, due to the formation of a thin liquid film creeping towards the heater, there was a transfer of superfluid helium this is known as the thermomechanical effect. This is illustrated in figure 4010. Instead, if one arm of a U tube is lengthened into a capillary as shown in figure 4011, the bent portion is packed with emery powder and the other arm having an orifice is immersed in a bath of helium 2, while light is shone on the portion containing the emery powder a fountain flow is observed at the end of the capillary also again due to the thermomechanical effect. The reverse of this effect is the mechanocaloric effect which is shown in figure 4012 where two vessels A and B are connected by a capillary through which only superfluid can pass and a pressure is exerted on A then some superfluid will flow to B and the temperature in B will fall that is the mechanocaloric effect. All these experiments can be explained by assuming that the superfluid has zero entropy and being cold readily moves towards the source of heat. Since there is no entropy transport from A to B, the entropy per unit mass increases in A and decreases in B. Hence, the temperature of A will rise and that of B will fall because C D T equals T D S, where C is the specific heat. Another very striking effect of this phenomenon of superfluidity is that of the propagation of second sound. in liquid helium 2. We are all familiar with the ordinary sound which is the first sound. The second sound is a temperature or entropy wave which propagates in addition to the usual pressure wave. This is called a second sound. A temperature gradient causes the normal component to flow against this gradient 
while the superfluid flows in the direction of the gradient such that the total density remains constant and the average velocity is 0. Since the superfluid has no entropy rho s is rho n s n. So, the net transport of entropy per unit volume may be written in the form of a partial derivative if the flow is along the x direction dou by dou x of rho s. The loss of entropy because of this transport per second is minus dou by dou t of rho s. So, the equation of continuity demands that these two are equal and a little bit of algebra shows using the kinetic energy density we can write the equation of motion as for these waves entropy waves as is the wave equation. So, that the speed of second sound is just what we have here. So, this second sound can be detected using a heater and the speed of these sound waves can be determined again that can give a value for the relative ratio of the superfluid to the normal fraction at any given temperature. Now, in contrast to this two fold model Landau emphasize the collective aspect and he said that in addition to longitudinal phonons, there are also excitations called rotons. The longitudinal phonons have the dispersion relationship the energy momentum relationship, whereas the rotons have the relationship it is a particle like excitation with an energy gap delta. So, both phonons and rotons obey Bose Einstein statistics and so or bosons. Since its energy gap delta is greater than k b t for t less than t lambda, so the roton assembly may be treated as a Maxwell Boltzmann gas. Then you can calculate the excitation spectrum by taking u 1 delta p naught and mu as adjustable parameters. So, he got the best fit to the specific heat data using this excitation spectrum which is shown in figure 40 13 also along with inelastic neutron scattering data which give you the full dispersion curve. The agreement between the experiment and theory is quite remarkable. Next we consider another interesting aspect namely that of helium 3 
helium 4 mixtures. What happens when you mix helium 3 and helium 4? The phase diagram of such mixtures is shown in figure 4014. A is the region of normal homogeneous mixture, B is the region of superfluid homogeneous mixture and C of a phase separated mixture. So, you can see that above point 86 k helium 3 and helium 4 can be mixed in any proportion. However, beyond a certain concentration of helium 3 there is no superfluidity. If helium 3 is more than 6 percent, then below 0.86 k, the helium rich phase separates and floats above the helium 4. So, this is above 0.6. So, this is the region I am talking about below 0.86 k. The equilibrium concentrations are given by points such as p and p dash at say 0.5 k. Why is the tri critical point? As t tends to 0, the solubility of helium 3 in helium 4 tends to about 6 percent. Based on this interesting behavior of helium 3, helium 4 mixtures, a dilution refrigerator has been invented which dilutes the helium 3, helium 4 mixture by driving the helium 3 atoms across the phase boundary. So, this dilution is useful in achieving very low temperatures, refrigeration at very low temperatures. of the order of say down to 2.3 millikelvin. We now turn to a brief discussion of solid helium that is the prototype of the quantum solid. The small mass of the helium atom makes the thermal wavelength lambda and the average distance between atoms to be of the same order of magnitude for t less than or equal to t naught. Hence, the helium atoms are not localized at the atomic sites in the solid state. In terms of the uncertainty principle, this can be understood as follows. If we want to confine the helium atom within a distance of the order of say 0.5 angstroms from its equilibrium position, this is confined helium atom within of its equilibrium position. In order to do this, the uncertainty principle says that we must have H cross that would be the order of the momentum and uh, square divided by 2 m. That would be the uncertainty in energy and this in temperature units is as high as 9 k for helium. So, this energy is sufficient for the helium to escape out of the confining potential. So, localization not possible. So, that is the key to the understanding of the behavior of solid helium. So, except under an external pressure which squeezes this uh, helium atoms together, whereas argon solidifies under ambient pressure in contrast to helium. This is because of its larger mass. And hydrogen also solidifies 
because of its stronger interactions, stronger molecular interactions. Unlike these two, helium cannot solidify by itself except under external pressure. The concepts which I have discussed here can be found in the book on statistical mechanics by Agarwal. Agarwal and Eisner. 